Hello. Hello. What a lovely theater this is. Nice, right? It's a beautiful facility. Yeah. Apparently, it's been here for two years. This is my first time. Well, welcome. We're happy to have you. Thank um, you. It's a yeah, pleasure to be here. Welcome to Film Society Lincoln Center. Thank you. So, I want to augment the trailer a bit because I'm probably pretty certain that most people, if not all, have not seen it yet since it doesn't. The film doesn't come out until next week. So that's probably it is on iTunes. So some of you could have downloaded it on iTunes. Okay. All right. Right on. That's right. Ultra VOD. Very important. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so for those who haven't done that, um, right. maybe let's, let's augment the trailer a little bit. And one thing that I got to see it um, very recently. Um, one thing I noticed that there's quite a tone that starts out when your character, Tom, arrives in Chicago. Um, there's sort of a tension, anxiety. Um, he has to take on a massive challenge um, that he already knows he has to take on. And then, of course, there's this other ar area that's happening as well. And we can maybe get to that in a bit. But just kind of talk about the tone, um, how the movie begins. As, you know, We don't want to give away the whole house, but we want to give a little bit more of a well, sense. Uh, keep in mind that we directors we don't like trailers at all because it's, uh, <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that the writers neither I mean uh, speaking for Damien Tassel the writer of the script uh, this kind of a spoiler but on the other hand we, uh, we're in 2014 and it's impossible I'm not going to be like Alfred Hitchcock like taking pictures of my cellar saying if you don't do it on time uh, you're not going to allow you to step in the screening room you know in the theater um, I have to say that I, I'm very happy because I, I, I think that it's loyal to the spirit of the movie. It's a movie that um, is not hiding the fact that it's nostalgic of another way of telling stories. I could say that um, we've been talking about that all day long. The fact that uh, I the irony of this movie is that it's um, 20 years ago it will be a mainstream movie. in, in the ha but Because it's a movie that is not showing their back. Uh, it's back to, to the audience at all. It's a movie that it, it has a um, as a goal to seduce. Did you, and did you say 20 years ago it would have been a mainstream movie? Yeah, yeah. 20, yeah. yeah. 20, uh -huh. 20, 25. Okay. I'm talking about people like artisans, uh, like Richard Donner, or people, you know, like, uh, or John Badham, or jo the late John Frankenheimer. Directors that i grown up with and that I loved and, and that for some reason Hollywood fails to deliver. Mm. And um, maybe you can talk about a little bit more of that on yeah. that, that topic. What's, what's Tom I feeling at the opening as he's it, arriving? And you know, you could tell at Chicago. Obviously, they're driving down that oh, so famous sort of street along like Shorb Drive. I think the setting of the the tone of the film. Well, yeah, I mean, it, you know, the establishing this, the establishing sense of uh, of dread, effectively within the context of this trailer that you pick up on, uh, or within the context of the beginning of the film that you pick on very quickly, is that this character uh, is about to play the piano again for the first time in five years, and he, he's been away from the instrument. You sort of start to glean because he'd had a, an incident with the instrument five years prior where he tried to play a piece that he failed miserably in front of a group of people. So, you know, the immediate sense upon landing is that he does not want to be in Chicago. He does not want to be returning to this instrument. And that basically sets forth uh, a, a growing sense of dread as he approaches the instrument itself and of course, <laughs> it gets worse when he sits down at the instrument and opens up his score and sees that there's notes from someone who is claiming to have a gun trained on him and his wife, and that if he misses a note, that he'll be killed. Uh, so it, what a night to have stage fright. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this, this piece that is sort of central to it is, is quite pivotal. Um, I wrote it down because I don't... La Cinquette? La Cinquette. But La Cinquette. Yeah, okay, I was going to do a Cinquette, but maybe not. Okay, La Cinquette. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The unplayable piece. The unplayable piece. So La Cinquette, um, you know, we get a lot of information compacted in the beginning of the film, but we come to learn that La Cinquette was a, a piece written by Patrick Godereau, who is the um, composer, pianist, whose piano my character is, is playing on. Um, and who was a tutor to my character. Um, and it was th also the piece of music that my character had failed to play in front of a large group of people, which is why he has stepped away from the instrument. So La Cinquette is kind of the ghost in the machine, if you will, uh, at the core of the film. I th it was, uh, when I was watching as well, like, I, th I thought it was interesting, sort of this interplay between obviously his stage fright for lack of a better word I don't or at least anxiety for playing the piece and then you know and then as this sort of sinister <laughs> voice um, enters enters the whole fray um, the sort of interplay that Tom has as he's performing in front of the stage in front of this uh, what's clearly a very um, elite audience 
I think is probably fair to say they're, you know, not just running into You're some right. concert. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that was interesting, this interplay, and I was kind of wondering how you guys, like, worked together, or how did you want, want to convey this, this, this tension that was building? <sighs> so many. Well, first of all, the script by itself, I mean, it was, I have to say that it's written uh, by a director and a filmmaker, and it's not only a writer. Damien originally wanted to direct the movie himself, um, uh, I have to say that he made this uh, movie, Whiplash, that has been, uh, well, in Sundance has been a great success, and uh, so I, it's a, well, it's an amazing movie. Um, and when I talked to him, it, it was clear that he was obsessed with music, and he was obsessed with uh, cinema, or in, let's say that Hitchcock, of course, it's, in, uh, it's there, in, to the core of the project. But at the same time, there was this, um, this idea of, uh, transferring the anxiety that he, that it has, I mean, his character has nothing to do with a civilian. I mean, he's a, a skillful individual that is able to do something that we're not able to do. So at the beginning, you're not supposed to be empathizing with him at all. Mm. You're just saying, why is this guy being so quirky? Why is not feeling comfortable after all? He's having this chance and maybe th th is he's just a diva. I mean, you don't have to like him. That is complicated working with this amazing human being called <laughs> Elijah Wood. But thank God he's a, he's a great actor, so he can be disgusting and and uh, <laughs> because that's what an actor does. It doesn't matter how beautiful and and oh, the Jesus that you want to hack him so much, he's able to <laughs> play uh, incredible characters. Uh, yes, I had to say it. Uh, thank so, you. So. I'm glad I delivered uh, being unhuggable for yeah. the beginning of the film. You're most probably the most huggable actor in the history of humanity. <laughs> <laughs> he, he said I could it. be wrong. You I mean, heard it here first, guys. Okay. <laughs> Lincoln Center, there we go. Yeah. Free hugs after the Q&A, everybody. No. Okay. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, but yes, what I'm saying is that um, there's a moment that we start to be with him. And it's when he's taking advantage of the situation and start being like, complaining and getting back to what you said about the elite thing there's something very very powerful about the fact that we're portraying an audience that is there mm -hmm. like willing him to fail in a way it's like the bull i'm a spaniard so it's like the bullfighting thing you know uh, no nobody talks about that but you know that when you go to see that there's this possibility that you know the bullfighter is gonna die right. and um so on the other hand the fact that he's being forced to play the unplayable piece. The fact that the bad guy in the movie is forcing him to overcome his fears and make it right, I think that it made completely uh, unmatched this kind of story. i never seen something like this. And I read the script and it was like, okay, if the, all I have to do is not defy why it works so well on paper and make sure that it doesn't matter what we do, we don't screw it up. And, that we, and it seems like if the movie works, I think it's, it has to do with the, the purity of the basic premise. That is a crazy premise, I have to say. And, it's uh, a crazy premise. It's a really crazy and highly improbable. Ahenio likes to say that it's not based on true events. Yes, I like to say that before. <laughs> um, I'll, I should so say a disclaimer. Yeah, it's very important. Yeah, Th this never happened. This never happened. Definitely <laughs> not in Chicago. Maybe no. In a third world country, perhaps. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> but I think to to your to your question as well as you know specifically about the tension in the film. And I think Eugenio can speak to this as well. Is so much of that was was down to the language of cinema and the construction of of of, of each sequence, mm -hmm. and all of that was um, predetermined before we started shooting because of. Well, I really shouldn't be the one articulating this. Um, I'm enjoying so much or <laughs> talking. I'm just the, the when he read guy. The, when he read the script initially on on paper, it all works, um, but it's extremely complicated because. It, Imagine, you know, you couldn't, you, you realize when you read the script that you can't just attach any kind of music because it doesn't actually work. Mm -hmm. Damien wrote very specific musical references for, for sequences, but if you were to then attach a piece of existing music, that swell would not be in the place that he mm -hmm. had articulated. So it, it actually demanded for music to be written very specifically for the visual cues that Damien wrote. Yeah, the best way to put it Take is that the, the real score of the movie is the sequence of events portrayed on paper. Mm -hmm. That to me was what it was creating, the dynamics. And I'm a musician myself, so if I had to decide when the music was underlining exactly what you were seeing and when it was going against that in a way and how to create 
like three levels of semantics and going through visuals and making sure that if I'm uh, in a stream close-up of him just focusing on the sound of the conversation with John Cusack, I'm going to be with his ear, but he turns and we see his eyes, and then we see what he's looking at, creating all this I don't know, 30 story building of, of layers and, ma and make sure that at the end of the day, people are going to be seeing this guy sat right in front of a piano playing and in this adventure movie of an, a guy sat right in front of a black Cadillac with the strings and there's like a big coffin, you know? And um, well, uh, that, that's the challenge. I mean, it's, um, it's hard to say where it starts, the music and the dynamic visuals, because as I said, a lot of people talk to me about Hitchcock and Brian De Palma being an influence, and I say, well, that wasn't on the script. What I really was aiming for is about, uh, I went to the, the opposite of the spectrum, apparently, to a musical that is a silent movie. But uh, in silent cinema is where you see dynamics and, 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 and the musicality based on just the sequence of images, only playing with the size of a shot the length of a shot, when a cat comes, and what was the shot before and the, and the shot that comes after that. So this is a movie that is really musical without the music, and then it has music, but it has nothing to do with the music, right. or it does. <laughs> 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 kind of. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yes, something like that. I, well, well, it's complicated to talk about this movie, isn't it? It's just a thriller. It is, it I mean, you just see it. it, it I it, love it. At the end of the day, it is just a thriller. It's just, yeah. But it is complicated. Uh, yeah. It's extremely complicated. Complicated to But achieve. it's not complicated to it's watch. Not, yeah. uh, that's it. <laughs> it's just it's complicated to talk about how we made it. We worked very hard <laughs> to make a movie that if you see it and you had a good time, it's like the biggest compliment we can have. But we worked like three times more than any other movie demands. T totally. It's a stupid. And I love it, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're all going to die someday. We'll look back at... Remember when we worked three more times than it was required? Yeah, that was... To make this little movie? Yeah. What are we What, what were, were we thinking? thinking? <laughs> <laughs> and here we are today. So to commemorate that from the future, in a way, we're time travelers. That's <laughs> we are time travelers. So Elijah, I want to put you on the on the on the spot about your your Jeez. piano skills. But okay, let's tr let's do it anyway. How how adept are you at the piano? Since you do spend since Tom spends a lot of time in front of it. Um, yeah. How, how did the, how was that all? <laughs> uh, I'm not nearly as adept as I would it would seem by watching the film. Mm -hmm. um, I took lessons when I was young. So from about 10 to 14, on and off, I was taking lessons. Um, I, I developed a very bad habit, which was that I would memorize the, the song in the lesson. Mm -hmm. So when it came time to practice, I would just play from memory and not, and not read the music. So I was very lazy. I just wanted to play. <laughs> <laughs> and I just got bored with practicing, which I think is typical. I think there are two camps of kids who learn how to play the piano, the ones that stick with the instrument and the others that just get bored and say that they don't want to play anymore. Regrettably, I quit. Anyway, um, as it pertains to this, I at least had that foundation. So I knew where middle C was. I knew about hand placement. In some ways, from memory, I could still play old pieces of music. So I knew my way around a piano, but I, I, I really, in, in so many ways, I was effectively starting from scratch. Um, but it was important to me that I, we make this as accurate as possible. I didn't want it to... Um, I didn't want to take for granted that, that responsibility. Mm -hmm. And because the, the character is meant to be a genius piano player uh, and the pieces of music are extremely complicated, particularly the last piece of music, uh, it was extremely important that we make that as accurate as possible. Mm -hmm. I had to kind of wait because of the music was being constructed and, and, and compiled within the context of the animatic. So once that was finished is when I could sort of really delve into the, the piano work. and I, I had about three weeks in Los Angeles prior to going to Barcelona to, to start working on the film. So I worked with a piano teacher in LA. She had an approach, you know, besides the fact that she knew that we were making a film and that I wasn't really going to be playing the piano and she knew that there's no way in three weeks she could get me to that place. Um, she did sort of teach me from the perspective of, 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 a, of a teacher does a regular student, which was both really incredible in the sense that the learning curve was massive and I took a lot of knowledge out of that. I mean, it, she got me back to reading music again, uh, and uh, which is kind of extraordinary. Um, I got really far with her, but the thing, it was also incredibly discouraging because I can't play. <laughs> so there would be times where I thought I had my head around it and I'm like, oh, this is, I'm gonna, uh, this is gonna be, it's gonna be fine. And then there were days where I just, 
I, I was completely discouraged and and uh, I thought that I was incapable. So maybe there was of doing a bit this. of a, a parallel going on with your character. There totally was. It was like there, you were kind of mirroring a bit. Absolutely. Um, Tom. I was petrified. Yeah, yeah. I was <laughs> petrified. I'm not gonna lie. Um, the thing that did help though yeah. is because of this animatic, I had the benefit of knowing very specifically which shots would include my face and my hands at the same time. So instead of having to learn every single note for every piece of music, I had kind of a roadmap of, of like, you know, bar 90 to 115 and so on and so forth. That really helped. It made it a lot more digestible, but I was still petrified. So I flew to Barcelona and then I, I started working with my instructor there who was also the double for, for my hands in the film. Mm -hmm. His name was Hector. And it was there that I really was able to get my head around it. And the one thing that I realized that would be extremely helpful was if they could film, I, it just dawned on me, if he would film his hands from my like the eye perspective onto the keyboard, I would be able to, because that's what you look at if you're playing. I would then be able to look at the hands and the placement on the keyboard as a, as a sort of memory mm -hmm. uh, and placement. Mm -hmm. And that made all the difference in the world. So, so much of it uh, was aided by that particular perspective that I could call on if I needed it. Um, and of course, we betrayed the very specific points of music that I was supposed to learn for the film and oftentimes we went much farther than was anticipated. <laughs> um, but at that point, I, the, the score was, it became like, it was in our pores at that point. So I became so familiar with it that it, it did become easy to, to sort of bounce in and out and, and get to places that I wasn't as comfortable with. Um, it's a very long answer, guys. I'm so sorry. No, it's good. <laughs> Things are not easy to articulate. It's really, it really to explain it. Yeah. I, I don't want to. I don't want to give you a cheap answer. The piano deserves it. You know, yeah. you got to respect it the piano. But it was uh, also <laughs> the piano was muted, which initially freaked me out because the the sound when I was practicing, I practiced on a real piano, and the sound, because I understand music, the sound the sound helped me to know if I was on the right track, right? But it also was a deterrent because if I were to get it wrong, I would know I got it wrong and I'd want to stop. So it was actually really great that they muted the piano because it would have totally fucked me up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no, you mentioned uh, Hitchcock a couple of times in your previous, or some a few minutes ago. I was wondering if, if there was some of those films or like other filmmakers that you were sort of thinking, had in mind, in the back of your mind as you were approaching this project and maybe had Elijah check out probably again <laughs> or something going into it to be honest what uh, i went I, I tried not to go for the obvious source of uh, i mean hitchcock to me is part of my life like uh, a lot of people just watching movies my parents uh wanted me to see those movies they thought that it was like a good idea and and uh, thank god that they showed me those movies when i was a kid but um what i really shared with him at the very beginning was um uh, uh the music director, um, how was called the com uh, conductor, Karajan. He's very. He was obsessed with uh, shooting how an orchestra uh, goes and going for the to transfer the idea of what the orchestration is and the different voices and different instruments. And he went into this crazy. I think it's the 50s and the 60s um, about placing the camera in the most unexpected places. It looked like this kind of German movies with Lenny Riefenstein, like kind of the the Nazis thing, like really going into this incredibly powerful imagery with the extreme low angles and wide angles and suddenly like the hands and a row of people with the brasses. Yeah. And I wanted to share this with him because I, I, I told him, we're going to go into this realm. And uh, I think there was a good indication because I really thought about what is so hypnotic and, and powerful and mesmerizing in Hitchcock movies. And it's the fact that he is basically a silent movie director. Mm -hmm. That's how he started. And sequential art in uh, basically any discipline that uses the flux of time as an analog uh, way of perceiving uh, things moving and then you don't see that it's too fast or too slow. You take for granted that they are happening. And how violent is the fact that any spectator from the very beginning of cinema, they take for granted that between a cat and another, there's an ellipsis and suddenly there's uh, two weeks later and people is not like saying, what is this? What, what, what happened? <laughs> Do you see that? What just happened? What? It's like, what? Are we time traveling? No, people is like, 
yeah, of course, like in a like in it's a book. Two weeks later, and exactly. So I took advantage of that of what most probably inspired Hitchcock to be so effective, and that's silent, mm-hmm. silent cinema. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's not that I went well. I actually went to, to I, I went for uh, Metropolis because I love that movie in so many different aspects. Mm. But when I saw that basically I could do anything as long as I don't repeat myself the same camera position and that I know what I'm doing it in a certain way, why there's a movement that it's going to be like wide angles and another one that's going to be like... Uh, we never did a master shot. We never did a master shot. We never, meet, we, we never made coverage. Imagine this movie being like an up for an hour and a half or a, an hour, you know, the concert, just covering from different angles, a guy playing and then editing like saying... It's just a guy sitting down down there, but uh, when you start to betray the, per- the you know the perception of what's happening here, the discrimination is the the most powerful tool of a of a filmmaker, mm. and that's how it was at the beginning. It's like you're showing this. If I'm pointing at his gorgeous blue eyes, <laughs> I know that I got something there, but like I'm not gonna eye. be doing that all the time. Because I'm I'm not stupid. I mean, it's not, I'm going to be showing his eyes all the time. But I know when I'm going to use that card, this beautiful pool eyes, <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, laugh at it. But I had to make that decision. It's okay. Maybe in page fifty-five, that's the particular moment that we're going to unveil this bigger than life beauty. And uh, it, and if you go to the silver screen, you're going to see his beautiful blue eyes <laughs> in in that particular moment. And we're not announcing it. It's like, but it has. It had to have a value, or it had to mean three things to me: one for the script, two for the money, three for the show. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to to make to make a long story short, so there's no by by all means there's no cheap decisions when about what resource to use. I mean, I ch- triple checked every single decision, and I'm very proud of it because I mean, all these restrictions instead of being like confining my work, it, it was like, oh my God, when you are so limited, you, you realize of what happened? Oh, it's all good. It's a good sneeze. Yeah. <laughs> wow. It's a sniper here. It's a red dot suddenly. We're going <laughs> to... Sorry. I'm going to cue my, my colleagues upstairs for the, uh, the first clip um, here in a moment, which I'm going to let you intro. But I will say as an audience member, the... The, the the eyes are in full splendor, so definitely oh, come check it out. Yeah. So <laughs> just going to okay. top that one off. We're going to ride that to the final wave. Okay, so um, intro the first clip, and then yeah. we'll take a look, and then we'll continue uh, the conversation. The, the clip that we're going to see now, I love this. It's like I know everything. It's like he told me, well, wow, this is the first clip, and this is the second one. That's a trade secret. And it looks like I know, yeah, I know everything. It's like, well, here's this clip we're going to about to see. But it portrays the first time that uh, John Cusack's character establishes his contact with him. And we listen to his voice and uh, unveils. I mean, it's not a spoiler because you don't know exactly what's going on. We listen to music. We could think that that music that we're about to listen to, it's the soundtrack. We're not going to explain how we use the music in the movie, when is the soundtrack and when it when it's not, and how we decided to make you understand when is the soundtrack and not. If, or if we simply, maybe we don't, I don't know. So, oh, my God. <laughs> this is not the intuition of a clip. This is like, exactly. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and that's, English is not my first language. <laughs> okay, so. Fuck these, are, it. these are hot Sorry. mics. Okay. Oh my first God. clip, this guys. Is, it's a little bit distorted. I it's think very the, hot mic. I'm getting like in it's a, a hot, hot, hot black mic. Black metal band. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. Please. <laughs> there's, the a, clip. there's only Jesus. one way to stop this. Save me. Play the clip. What am I up to? Did Norman put you up to this? Norman? I don't follow. Look, I I get it. It, It's funny. The stage fright guy, you send him messages because you think he's wetting his pants. Are you? No. Would you like me to change that? Listen to me. Are you sure this is a prank? 
Let's have a bet. I'll bet it's not a prank. You bet it is. If I win, I get to spray the famous Emma Selznick's brains all over a Gucci purse. If you win, you get to tell me all. Come on, this will be a fun bet. Let's do it. I'm calling the cops. My friend is outside the theater. He sees so much as one cop car pull into the lot, and the ushers will have a corpse to clean up in box seat five. Now head to the left side of the stage. Now. Well, that was the first clip. And now I can, thank you. <laughs> and now I, keep, I can keep digging my own grave. Uh, <laughs> but yes, well, this is the first time that we hear the amazing voice of John Cusack. But uh, put your hands together for John Cusack. Yeah. But, uh, he's not <laughs> here with us. And thanks, because that leads right into my next question. Very good. Um, so I both with this film and then last year, The Paperboy, I yeah. sort, of, sort of saw a whole other side of John Cusack. He can be like one sinister motherfucker. <laughs> I mean, you know. Something tells me that he is really interested in going in that yeah. direction now. Uh, or at least trying to do something different to what you expect from him. It's true that uh, he's got this image of, you know, huggable big guy that uh, that is like the the perfect girlfriend, uh, boyfriend for to your sister or something. And um, But now he's like, in a very interesting stage of his career, I have to say. How was it like working from Tom's point of view, well, Elijah Wood's point of view, working with John Cusack, um, oh, who's, who's kind of out to you know, destroy you? It was a treat. Um, it was a treat for all of us. You know, we, we grew up watching this guy in cinema, so uh, to, to have, have him fly to Barcelona, and I'll never forget the first day that we met him, actually. Because I was with Eugenio and the other two producers. And we knew he was arriving, but we weren't sure if he was going to be up for having dinner. He'd just come from Los Angeles. So we thought, oh, we'll let him rest. We'll meet him for drinks. And he's like, yeah, yeah, we'll meet for drinks. Fine, great. So we go to the hotel, and he's, he's, uh, he's agreed to meet us at this bar. It was like a terrace bar in Barcelona at this hotel. And we get up there, the four of us, kind of like n nerdy geeks in the elevator, like, ooh, <laughs> nervous. <laughs> Come to on, meet him. It's John Cusack. It's John Cusack's Cusack. waiting John Cusack. for us. Uh, it was fantastic. And um, we didn't know what we were going to encounter. And so we, we get up there and we, we see him sitting. And he's kind of, you know, 15 feet away. And he's sitting there by himself. Um, there's like a little table in front of him and another chair. And he's got like a lamp next to him. And, um, and he's smoking a cigar, looking very cool. He's sitting there like, wow, fucking John Cusack. So we, we, we walk over and we all introduce ourselves and he was very polite. He was lovely, um, very tall. Um, and he was so polite. He was very complimentary of myself and, yeah. and you know, very keen to, to work with Eugenio. And we all sit down. It was lovely. And, uh, and he sits down. This is my favorite part. He sits down and he turns off the lamp next to him. <laughs> And then we continued to have a conversation. Yeah. But it was, such a, it was such a smooth move. And I didn't quite understand. He had Maybe the lamp control. was like the beacon for, for yeah. recognizing where he was. And then he turned it off because now you're here. I don't know what it was. But it was smooth. One thing is certain. We will never forget it. We will never forget it. Never. Um, ever. But he's, he was wonderful. He was a great collaborator. And he had great ideas. And he was only with us for a week. Um, we literally shot all of the scenes that he's on camera, so basically the end, the climax of the film in that first week, which felt strange to film the end of the movie before we shot any of the piano sequences. Uh, felt like a completely different film. But it was, it was great. And then he, uh, he kindly recorded because he ended up leaving. He didn't really need to stay there to be off lines for me for the entire three weeks of, of all the piano stuff. So he kindly recorded all of that so that that could be cut into the audio track. So while we were making the film and while we were shooting all the, the, the piano sequences, I would hear his dialogue in my ear and then respond uh, to the pre-recorded dialogue. And it was great. Mm -hmm. And there was a fair amount of acrobatics without giving away too much um, that happened. Sort oh, of yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's like stunt work. Yeah. I was in a harness. I was <laughs> hanging from passerelles. And got Shh, don't spoil it. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> it gets intense. It gets, it gets intense. intense. There's a piano and there's acrobatics. Exactly. Yeah. So loud. <laughs> Live your imagination. Flow. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And there is. You guys didn't know what you were getting tonight, did right. you? <laughs> no. 
<laughs> I don't want to get to these guys' questions because I'm sure they have some. Me too. Oh, please, yeah. please. Um, but just really quickly, talk about working what, what looks like a full orchestra as well. Um, there's quite a scale, as you mentioned, you were alluding to earlier to this that comes off on the big screen. So what about what? How was it working with that and integrating all of that into the into the whole thing? And then we'll have you intro clip two. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, it was very. I mean, it's it's really complicated to explain. I'm gonna try to do my best. Um. The guys, I mean, they were real musicians, of course, and they had uh, chart music. I mean, that it was written for them. And that music was uh, something that we put together, the composer and me, that is not the final result that you're listening to now. It's something that was responding to the demands of the events. And as, of course, uh, well, I, when I was digging my own grave before, what I was about, now I'm going to, you know, try to put some... Uh, Thro throw some light to the, all this mess that I was putting there. And basically, what we end up deciding is to make sure that the movie had these two different goals at the same time when it comes to the music. That the same music that the concert is playing, sometimes it's underlining the emotions, so it's the soundtrack of the movie. And some of the times, it's just the music that the audience in the hall are really experiencing. Some, uh, sometimes that movie is different, and, other, and some of the times the same music equally uh, fits with our purposes. But that's a very inner kind of a program that we established. And uh, all we had to make sure is that the musicians were going to be doing what... I mean, you cannot do this movie showing the audience going through, flying through the, you know, over the heads of the orchestra and, go and getting him and see guys doing this randomly because it's going to be a total mess. So, yes, there is a score that they learned and that they played and that it was growing because it was like thrown through the, pre, uh, through the PAs. We had a true uh, conductor that was at the same time the coach for uh, Norman Reisinger, the character played uh, beautifully by Don McManus, uh, the one and only. And um, it was a very, s we reached a point really like into the third week that the musicians were really feeling the music that they were playing, and they were playing so loud that they were even louder than PA. The, the PA, and it was a very strange thing. And there were some times where the PA would cut off and they would keep playing exactly, the music. Exactly, and they keep playing. It was, uh, there was some strange energy going on there. I, I, I have to say this. Uh, I think that cinema is all about illusionism. Is where Houdini took the things. You know, It's like making people believe something, and you take that. I mean, the, the suspension of disbelief, you know that no, nothing of this really happened. But you're feeling that it's happening, and that's that's beautiful. It's not about making you, making you believe that this is really happening. It's not a documentary, but it's true that when you force the elements of nature, as we do, for this movie to achieve what we wanted, when the um, letter to Santa Claus for one specific shot was so long, and we achieved it, and everybody was aiming to achieve that particular sequence of events in just 35 seconds, we started to notice what is perceived as magic. That is a very scary thing, I don't want to get into this, but uh, I heard that um, Steven Spielberg shooting historical movies like Lincoln or Amistad or Schindler's List, when they're invoking something that happened in real life, people dress like this and they say action, there's people crying, like maybe the Jews and the Nazis, all this stuff. There was a moment that, uh, and now I'm <laughs> really getting a little bit nervous, that is like, oh my God, this is getting out of hand. I mean, we're really doing this ritual of invoking something that is transcending just playing with something. And um, well, that's it. I mean, making movies is like kids playing, but kids really have this vivid imagination. And when you see adults that for a living, they're pulling, you know, some camera on, on some tracks and all that, it's easy to see, oh yeah, this is just, you know, smokes and mirrors. But there is a moment they cross that line. And I have to say that in Grand Piano, there were moments that they were bigger than us, and it's a very strange thing. I, I don't expect this to happen. I'm not looking for this kind of thing, but it happened to us, and, and it, well, thank God it's in the movie. If the movie is effective, it was effective for us and in certain days and certain moments. It, we don't talk too much about this, but it's... No, it's true. It's true. There's, yeah. a, there's a moment that you feel that it's witchcraft instead of illusionism. <laughs> Let's leave but it that, that. That speaks to the experience that we had making it, and there was, yeah. there was a lot of... There was a lot of feeling that there was something quite magical happening that was n not necessarily because it was part of the, the people involved, but there was something special uh, at play as well, which is... Well, you said it pretty well. Is when like it all when comes you have together, it can people be very good in their 
one area that suddenly the, the confines of what they're doing are blur because mm. every everyone is going in the same direction. Yeah. I felt like one more of the team. I didn't even feel like the guy who was dictating this. I, I wasn't Moses with a tablet saying this is what we have to do. It was like I never wrote this. It was, it was like an epiphany. It suddenly not even the script it was mm. it was really happening uh, that's a very strange thing i guess that if you're making a john casavetes movie it's easier to see gina rollins going nuts um, but you don't expect that in a thriller you know about a guy playing a piano for them it magic can happen even in a movie like this it Absolutely. can happen with indiana jones it can happen with star wars with yoda it's a, come on it's a it's a, it's a puppet it comes a heightened sense of creation with a yeah, group of people who happens. are all attuned to the same thing that you're creating and i can tell you that in the case of grand piano when it comes to grand piano it happens all right, I'm gonna, What's the next cue, clip? We're going to cue exactly. clip two, um, and you intro it, and we'll play it, and then the we'll next, get to your questions. The next clip is uh, from this movie that I love, Midnight Cowboy, played by the... So, no, not really. I would love to. I feel like Martin Scorsese, like, just for a clip that, of a movie, you know? Sorry. I was, is it Midnight the, Cowboy. It, the right red here. shoes. Yeah, yeah it's like, now, yeah. <laughs> then Sunset Boulevard, suddenly. I love this scene. Now, uh, next scene... Uh, I'm remembering. Da, 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 da. Yeah, it's. Uh, wow, I forgot. No, oh, yeah, sorry. This is this is a little bit embarrassing. But I think that it was. No, 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 no. Oh, no. Sorry. Here, Elijah Wood could read it. <laughs> or you could, whatever. You're getting a call there, sir. Do you remember? That's right. I I couldn't answer the phone. Well, sorry. this is one <laughs> embarrassing <laughs> moment after another. <laughs> Oh, this is lovely. You know, we're just having an event it's here. Like, it's I mean, so just because he's amazing and um, and you're going to be hanging him at the end of the screening, <laughs> he's going to introduce the clip instead of me. You know what that seems yeah, so it's a moment during the film um, where I'm taking directions from John Cusack's character. He he effectively directs my attention up towards the catwalk above me, um, and I see the the sort of uh, the product of what he's capable of doing. Mm -hmm. Thank All you. Right. All right, we'll roll the clip and then your questions. Good job. Thanks, buddy. I love you. And I love you. Look above your head. Watch carefully. I want you to see this. No. Keep it together. Keep playing, Tom. If you don't pull it together in one second, you'll be shot. Keep your fingers on the piano and your mind on the music. This will teach you how to focus. Steady. Good. Now make your conductor think everything's okay, or he'll be next. Tom, feeling better? Why? Why did you kill him? You've never seen a dead body before, have you? How do you think you can be a great artist with so little life experience? See, I've taught you in a way Patrick never could, which means you're ready now. What? A cat. Remember it? Just about to get heavy. Uh, that's the problem with this movie, is that... Uh, <laughs> Oh, one shot leads you to the next one and you want to keep you want to keep seeing it and it's like <laughs> oh something happened. Okay. And we couldn't see the it movie. It is the movie is is a, That's is a it's perpetual motion. It's a perpetual motion. Exactly. Q and A. Questions Q &A. questions for our fine guests. Greg. Oh wait, I have to we have to wait for the here, I'll give this to you first. We do need this you, is even if you yell, you still have to have the microphone. So in doing a thriller, how do you find the experience of making a thriller different from the other other films you've made are there things expectations or things in your head that you know you need to do or need to serve that kind of a story is this for both me well, and oh, mainly uh, you as an actor looking at me, yes as a director you kind of have more of a clear picture for you because you're responding to what's been given to you sure um well i mean i think that um I don't know that I was putting any, um, if I was changing my thought process as an actor to fit the confines of the, the genre of the film. I, I think my job within the context of, of this particular film as an actor is to respond to what, what the character's dealing with. The character's dealing with conflict, the conflict being that he's anxious about playing the piano again, and moreover, an even greater conflict, 
being that once he starts to play the piano, his life is threatened. Um, so that 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 was the parameters really f for for what the the character is meant to experience. So that could be, you know, in a in a thriller or in any other kind of film. So the, the the genre of the film wasn't something that I that I had to to pay too much attention to beyond just being true to what the character was experiencing. Um, yeah, but I think the the genre was something that was very interesting to me as an actor and largely why I was interested in, in working on the film, particularly character aside, that the, this particular thriller exists, a great deal of it in real time, and I found that very interesting, that you know, 75 to 80% of the film is happening during an actual performance on stage in front of an audience, um, and, and how to make that... Uh, an exciting and dynamic thriller, which it it jumped off the page. So that was an exciting prospect. Okay, so. questions? Um, yeah, in the back. Wait for the microphone, please. Hi, Elijah. I have a hey. question for you. Yeah. Uh, what were some of the challenges you had in doing this particular role, you know, compared to some of the other roles you've done in the past? Well, the 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 piano was the the primary challenge. <laughs> um, that was sort of a daily challenge. Um, but aside from that, I think the probably the probably the greatest challenge was because the a great deal of the movie is is the character sitting at, at the piano playing. I think the challenge was to make sure that there was some kind of progression um, that the character goes through over the course of the film. That it's not uh, that it's not simply playing the same notes throughout. You know that it's just stress or just duress. But that there that there that there are sort of peaks and valleys and and ultimately a sense of of growth. So that that to me was sort of what I had my eye on most of the time was to make sure that that was coming across and that there is a change that occurs over the course of the film. Uh, so I would say that was probably the most challenging aspect in a way, you know. Uh, okay, I'll go here and there. Okay, uh, wait for the microphone right here. In that clip, was that you playing, or was that your double? It was a mix. Okay. In that clip, because I think those that that top shot is Hector's hands, I believe. That, that, well, but I have to say, yes, because you know that uh, I I um, I've been taking a look at it. That the shots, if, if we you some the the length of the shots, when we just see hands that are not his hands, mm -hmm. it's 48 seconds in the whole movie. Uh, something that I, it's it's true. It's less than a minute. I mean, if you some here and there's little pieces, and I think in that particular one, yeah, in that particular shot, it's Hector. Yeah, it was Hector. The over. Yeah, the over. Well, yeah. because the fingering looked very awkward, and I don't know if it was the piece. <laughs> no, no yeah. not that you're well, the playing, proper fingering. but yeah. I play. I play. So just the way the awkward yeah. finger. But it's the, it's the way the music was written. And that's what and I, was uh, I mean. The, uh, was that the purposely. The music is so awkward okay. and the whole movie, and so <laughs> <laughs> how to say it. No, I know that it's supposed to be a I'm a piano player, yeah, so, so I know that that's, that's stupid, too. So, <laughs> let's have a drink. <laughs> 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 All right, when I get no, but next... It's, tr it's true, it's true. I mean, it's really, what the hell is this? Yeah, I'm <laughs> very aware of it. We'll go <laughs> Not here, proud, just aware. Here and back here, and I, I do see times are running, so we'll kind of get to the next one. Well, this is a question for you now. Mm -hmm. um, what did you want, as a director, what did you want audience to feel while watching this movie? Because I know exactly what I felt just from these two clips, and I just want to see, do we have the same opinion? Thank you. Uh, I think Sounds like a test. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what to feel, but I'm talking about believing it or not, I'm, I'm not but because I'm very aware of, to me, it's very important to, 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 to really enjoy this movie, not trying to have... Uh, any kind of uh, scientific approach to it is very important because uh, me being a musician, that's um, I knew in in what extent I had to please myself uh, to to make sure that it was going to be accurate. But on the other hand, it was a movie; it wasn't a documentary. That's one thing, and um, it's a it's a broad question because um, if you read the script, um, I, I try to unplug. The director reading that it's kind of impossible, but uh, just focusing on on being a spectator, it was like a very interesting. <laughs> how do you say it? 
crazy story. I mean, it, 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 it was ridic ridiculous. Ridiculous is a good word to define what I felt when I read the script. Ridiculous in the way that I mean, I mean, this is demanding a lot from the audience. And I, and then I thought, when I gonna sit down to really break this down and make sure that well, my goal is to make it look like a movie, a movie as a popular thing, as a song that you can get back home and whistle and uh, or you know th that's the difference between cinema I think uh, it, it's like in music and a song I mean great music has nothing to do with the structure of a song and a song can be amazing music but um, when it comes to cinema history uh, being p uh, popular or not showing your back to the audience and making great music is very rare we see it nowadays in Pixar for example uh, of course, with Steven Spielberg, that is my favorite director because of that, his sense of responsibility to deliver something that it's for the audience, but not because of that is going to be just crap. Sorry, if that's not the right word. I mean, Spielberg always been very, like, working his ass off to deliver something way more cra well crafted than what is required. And to me, that's an inspiring um, a way to go. This movie is what it is, and uh, I had the chance to give everything I had to sh see it 40 years from now and, and see all the... This is the beautiful thing I can say about cinema. It's today, in 2014, still the most incredible medium when it comes to put ideas on it. I mean, way more than music. It, it carries... You can go into politics, uh, mysticism, uh, surrealism, back in the headism. You can do... Uh, you can fill it with everything you want. And it's not important if people doesn't get it because if you're gonna feel it in any way, it's really emotional in, in a way. And and and, and the, the, to me, that's the only thing that it matters. Yes, I'm talking as a musician. Uh, I see the script as the libretto, and I'm making the music. And my music is not the music; it's you know how to transfer the anxiety of this man. So I think that it's a roller coaster. And if if you in some way feel attached to his character in a way. Uh, I think that we made it right. That's what I think that is the best way to approach the movie. Like, okay, let's see what happen. Uh, what happens if you have to make this concert? You suffered such fright in the past and suddenly you're forced to play it right. If that's a good or a bad thing and all these things about, you know, philosophy. Do you say in English it's hop or job when it comes to the the disciple of God in the Hebrew, you know, it's hop, isn't it? It's Job. 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 Okay, it's not job, like Steve Jobs, okay. So there's a lot of the, the whole thing. If, if you want me to be frank, there's a lot of the testing of, you know, Satan and God saying, okay, this guy is like your favorite. Let's see what happens if he's having a bad time, how he responds to it. And God allowing something awful to happen. But the fact that this character is willing something awful to happen to not play. Oh my God, we're going to be talking philosophy here for years. <laughs> and it's a script that it's just mm -hmm. this thing. It's a thriller, but, you know, you find your angle and you feel comfortable and, and you go for it. Let's try and get one quick last question. All right. Oh, so here. sad. Sorry, because these be guys forever. have to go. I, kn I happen to know your schedule too beyond this stuff. <laughs> it's a tight schedule. <laughs> Super tight. All right. Elijah, I, yes. just, I would like to know when you're filming a movie such as this one, uh, when you're offset, do you feel that affected by the role that you're playing? Do, do you take it home with In you? In terms of the stress of what the character's going through? Yeah. and uh, No. <laughs> well, no, no, but I, no, but I, but I went home. Dream, have these types of dreams or nightmares or you know those. Oh, I think the thoughts. music was in my head a lot, and probably in my nightmares. <laughs> you know, and I would go home because I, uh, the call sheet that we would get every day would be for shots, not for scenes, because the whole thing was constructed in animatic, and we knew what shots we were doing, and like we said, there was no coverage, so we just were shooting these individual pieces. And I'd have the correlating music go, to go along with that, so I knew what stuff I had to prepare for the next day. So that's what I was going home with every night, like, ah, oh, fuck. <laughs> right. <laughs> 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 yeah, man. And just to close out, I, I, you, uh, you have another part of your career um, where, you're, where you're behind the camera of sorts, and you you're actually produce films as yeah, well. Yeah. And you have a film that's going to be opening the new director's new film series, which is a series that we have here that my colleague mentioned. And I'm not going to be able to make it until March. Ago. Darn. I, I know. Was, what that, I was trying to oh, man, I get all these so people here to say, come, come, come. Oh, I, I'm, I so badly want to be there if any of you yeah. are attending. But you, the film, I mean, a give Girl it, Walks give it a, Home Alone at Night yeah. is the film. Mm -hmm. um, Anna Lily Am Amanpour is the director. She's an Iranian-American film director. She wrote it. I I'm so proud to be a part of the film, um, and I'm so proud of her. It's an extraordinary accomplishment. It's an Iranian black-and-white vampire western. 
Um, we were lucky enough to get it into Sundance uh, to a really warm reception, and I'm so pl- pleased that it's it's going to be showing here. That's wonderful. It's a great I'm movie. So I'm so that I too. can't be here because I just want to support it. But if anybody can get into that screening, please see the film. It's, it's a great really, movie. really special. Right. Okay. Well, please join me. And th- really quickly, you guys, they have to walk out so if everyone can remain seated as they do that. And, but in the meantime, thank you so much. Guys, this is a real pleasure. I, I wish so we could much. stay longer. And <laughs> thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. And thank all of you for coming as well. Appreciate it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.